Well, we chose on the Yellow. Um, good morning. I think it is because these lights are so bright. Uh, uh, I want to wish you health and help. Uh, and my name is O.J. Siemens. I'm the co-executive director of Four Directions, which is Native American Voting Rights Advocacy Group. Uh, and I'm so glad that you have taken the time today to talk a little bit about Indian country issues. And before we start, I want to say thank you for your service. Uh, it's not often where I get to sit by a fellow Navy man and listen to uh, how he is going to uh, win the presidency. So uh, with that, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask you some questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, back in 1990, the uh, House and the Senate passed a resolution uh, that identified the Wounded Knee as a Wounded Knee Massacre. Uh, recently, we had had the House and the Senate pass legislation or introduce legislation uh, in which is called the Remove the Stain Act uh, that is meant to remove the Medal of Honors awarded to soldiers that uh, massacred women and children at the Wounded Knee. And so my question is, as president, uh, would you be supported of that legislation? And as commander of chief, what type of action would, would you take? Yes, the time has come for us to withdraw any honors that have been associated with an act that is a moral stain on the United States of America. Uh, the Medal of Honor was designed uh, to honor acts of valor in defense of this nation, uh, upholding the security and the values of the United States. Uh, what happened at Wounded Knee was a massacre, a killing of uh, civilians, uh, a killing of Native Americans perpetrated in the name of the United States. And it is important that we withdraw those honors uh, conferred on people for perpetrating that, both because of uh, the need to come to terms with our past and because it sends a message into the future that uh, I'm afraid has only become more relevant as we've seen efforts to pardon war crimes that happened half a world away. Uh, how can we take the right stand, as we must, against any war crimes in the future anywhere in the world if we're not willing to own up to what happened right here on U.S. soil? And so as president, uh, I will uh, ensure that we take the right steps. Well, thank you. Um, and then leading up to that, we, we also have a, a, a pending crisis uh, in Indian country uh, that, that concerns missing and murdered indigenous women. And uh, we are going to be screening a world premiere of the missing and murdered indigenous women, Dr. Mary Terry, uh, somebody's daughter, at the Four Directions uh, Nevada Tribal Nations Presidential Forum. An advocate for the documentary is Congressman John Lewis. Um, who is committed to introducing comprehensive legislation based upon the recommendations of the Global Indigenous Council, Rocky Mountain Tribal Leaders uh, Council, and the Great Plains Tribal Chairmen's Association. One of the articles in the legislation fo focuses on the Congressional Fix of the Oliphant Cape ruling, um, which you, we know you support. Uh, can you explain the importance of the Oliphant Fix? And also, would you and your administration um, make a commitment to work with indigenous community organizations such as Global Indigenous Council and Four Directions in, in partnering to develop and implement solutions to the missing and murdered indigenous women's crisis. I will. The crisis of missing and murdered ind indigenous women is unfortunately still not a crisis that is well understood. And yes. uh, for many Americans, it's a silent or invisible one. Uh, but the cost that is uh, that this incurs on, on women, on families, on whole communities cries out for action. Uh, and uh, uh, we've seen indications that uh, there could be uh, as much as 10 times the risk uh, for Native, for Indigenous women when it comes to uh, the risk of, of uh, missing and uh, being going missing and, and even being killed. Uh, and this isn't going to go away on its own. It's why we need presidential level action. It's why we need to power, empower a commission uh, in partnership with the kinds of organizations you've mentioned to act on this. And we need to do something about the Oliphant case. Uh, the Oliphant uh, decision effectively degraded the ability of uh, tribal sovereign nations to use law enforcement tools in order to protect women. Uh, look, we know that uh, so many of these cases are cases where the perpetrator is non-native. Yes. And so jurisdiction cannot stop with tribal citizens. This is something that will take an act of Congress to fix, and I support that act of Congress. Uh, we need visibility, but we also need concrete policy solutions. And 
when women are found, when women return. We need to make sure that the care does not end but begins at that point because we know uh, traumatic experiences and harms can uh, go on through a lifetime and e even uh, impact others, uh, other loved ones that, that kind of flow through that, that, that path of harm that, that begins uh, with an act of violence against women. Uh, so this is why we need to make sure that we have the right kind of resources through law enforcement, yes, but also through IHS and through all of the tools that we have for health to deal with those kinds of traumatic experiences and ensure we bring an end to that crisis in our time. Great. Well, you know, I, I, listening to your answers, I'm, uh, I'm very happy to, to see that you are well aware of these and, and uh, have plans in order to, to address them. Uh, one of the things I want to talk to you now about is higher education. American Indians hold the lowest percentage of bachelor's degree in the nation. Only 16% of American Indians hold a bachelor's degree, while 42% of the white population holds a bachelor's degree. Yet American Indians have the second highest student loan default at 42%. Furthermore, Native students overwhelmingly re uh, rely on federal aid to attend college, with 85% of Native students receiving some type of federal grant or aid. As a result, programs like PAL and loan forgiveness uh, proposals have uh, unique implications in Indian country. How will you protect and expand programs like the PAL uh, grants and address barriers to higher education faced by Native students? Well, uh, we need to make sure that there's a level playing field and we need to invest in the success of Native students, especially, again, because of the disparities you're describing are the consequence of harm. Uh, that came about intentionally, done in the name of the American people, and that now we, uh, as, a, as a nation, have a responsibility to mend in our time. And there are very concrete things we can do about it. First of all, the existing programs that you mentioned need to be strengthened. Uh, Pell, in particular, uh, not only for tuition, but living expenses, because one of the reasons for the student loan default that is disproportionately happening to Native students is when people undertake loans but don't complete college. And one of the barriers to completion are the, the costs in addition to tuition of uh, being able to get through college. So we need to expand Pell. I would also propose that we make public college tuition free for the first 80% of Americans by income. Again, something that will disproportionately benefit uh, tribal citizens and native students. Uh, we also need to expand public service loan forgiveness programs. And we need to have loan forgiveness outright for people who were taken advantage of by some of these for-profit uh, uh, companies that right. ran uh, so-called universities that didn't really do much at all for students. But there's something else that I'm, I'm very excited about, which is the opportunity to proactively invest in tribal colleges. Uh, and we're proposing a, a $50 billion investment in institutions uh, like tribal colleges, uh, alongside minority-serving institutions and HBCUs uh, that can directly support uh, tribal citizens. Uh, but we need to make sure those tribal citizens, whether they're going to a tribal college or, or any other public education, uh, public higher education, are able to uh, access those benefits because that really is a ladder into greater prosperity. And of course, it is empowering, not just economically, uh, right. but politically, socially, and culturally for all Native Americans. Well, I, I can tell you that there are going to be tribal presidents uh, uh, in the colleges throughout Indian country. After hearing you, they're going to be smiling ear to ear. So, um, next thing I'd like to talk to you about is infrastructure. Infrastructure uh, is an important uh, part of Indian country. And one of the problems we have is because it is underfunded, undermaintained, underbuilt for decades, we have roads that are crumbling, waterways that are polluted, hospitals that are aging, bridges that are failing, sanitation facilities that have gone uh, unrepaired, homes uh, that, are, that are crumbling, infrastructure on a day-to-day -day basis uh, creating unsafe environmental and leaving communities vulnerable. Many pieces of legislation have been, uh, been introduced to address infrastructure in Indian country, and even less uh, will exist to ensure the necessary appropriations that are available. And I, I misquoted one is, there's not that much uh, legislation introduced when it comes to Indian country uh, infrastructure. So um, 
how would you ensure infrastructure maintenance, construction, and repair of top priority uh, would be a top priority within your administration? So uh, recently we uh, unveiled our infrastructure plan that will invest over a trillion dollars in making sure that we upgrade everything from what you see above ground, like roads and bridges, so many of which are structurally deficient in the yes. country, to things that don't get talked about, but I'm glad you mentioned, like water and wastewater. When you're a mayor, you think about those things all the time, yes. even if they're not quite as glamorous as uh, the, the roads, bridges, and bullet trains that are also uh, on people's mind, and rightly so when they think about uh, what infrastructure for the future means. It also means digital infrastructure, and it's why we've got to close the broadband gap that affects Indian country and rural areas disproportionately. Uh, we've uh, lined up the funding in our proposal that would make that possible, and that in turn is important for other priorities like education, uh, because uh, increasingly being able to complete your education includes being able to get online. We also need and have included in my infrastructure proposals a focus on equity. Uh, in other words, the fact that it is often uh, native communities, uh, African American, uh, Latino, and other communities that have disproportionately suffered from our failure to make these investments. And that's true in everything from uh, degraded uh, road and, and bridge infrastructure uh, to things like uh, what's going on in uh, homes that uh, have lead paint. And it's why we need a fund for lead paint mitigation in a community like my own. Uh, where we see uh, the water, I can assure you, is in very good shape because I was in charge of making sure the water was clean. But uh, we still have high rates of lead exposure and poisoning uh, because of uh, lead exposure in homes. And I know that's one of many health issues that is a health equity concern in Indian country. Uh, so all of these things are connected. And we're not going to be able to meet our goals economically uh, in terms of health or in terms of, uh, of prosperity unless we are investing to make sure we have the infrastructure that we deserve. It's a bipartisan uh, priority among the American people. Now we've got to make it a bipartisan priority in the American Congress. Great. Thank you. Um, another question that, um, uh, you know, re really uh, Indian country has always uh, suffered from uh, is, is our health care. Mm -hmm. and, and the Affordable Care Act and uh, Indian Health Improvement Act, um, as, as part of the overall uh, legislation was a permanent reauthorization and is a landmark piece of legislation that authorizes the provision of health care for American Indians and Alaskan Native people, uh, including uh, health, Indian health services. Uh, health care is a treaty obligation afforded to Native Americans in exchange for the millions of acres of land taken uh, by the federal government and also a treaty obligation for the peace treaties that the government signed with, with nations to, to stop war. And so my, my question would be, uh, to you is, as the Affordable Care Act uh, continues to undergo attacks, including the efforts uh, of some lawmakers to deem the legislation unconstitutional, how will your administration protect, expand health care uh, for Native American people? Well, uh, first of all, we got to recognize that as a treaty obligation, this is something that the United States must do to keep a promise and to uphold its end of a bargain. This is not a favor. Uh, this is the keeping of a promise. And it's why I believe we have to take the funding that goes to the Indian Health Service and move it from discretionary to mandatory. If we made a promise, then we have to have the funding secured. We also need to make sure that we're providing uh, better options for health care coverage, broadly speaking. And it's why I've proposed what we call Medicare for all who want it. I'm not going to force anybody onto a public plan, but we need to make sure there's no such thing as an uninsured American and creating that quality public plan for anybody to access who wants to and to make sure that it's affordable for everybody is a step that we can take throughout. Uh, we've also got to recognize the health inequities that are faced in Indian country. And part of our plan is to create health equity zones where there are solutions that can be developed by local or tribal governments but get more funding from Washington. Look, not all of the answers have to come from D.C., but I think more of the funding should in order to identify solutions to issues that are causing specific, measurable racial disparities in health in different ways and in different places. Well, thank you. And, and, and I can tell you that tribal nations have for years and years and years asked Congress uh, to move forward to have uh, the funding for our health care mandatory uh, in which we have not been successful. So I really appreciate you bringing that up. Uh, the other thing uh, I'd like to talk to you about that's important in the country is climate change. Mm. Uh, the impact of climate change are disproportionately, disproportionately uh, felt by tribal communities. Coastal tribes, uh, Alaskan Native communities are especially vulnerable to sea level rise and are increasingly catastrophic uh, natural disasters. The tribal coastal 
Coastal Resiliency Act was introduced into the House earlier this year and subcommittee hearings were held earlier this summer. The act will empower tribes with uh, resources to adapt to the plan uh, and plan for climate change, prioritizing both sovereignty and, and environment. Uh, how would your administration tackle uh, the climate change and the specific climate challenges faced by tribal communities? One of the things you'll see in my plans on climate change is a focus on equity, recognizing that there are communities, including tribal communities, disproportionately harmed by the effects of climate change. It means that when we're making investments in how to prevent climate change, especially when we look at the jobs that we are going to create, and we estimate three million new jobs will be created if we rise to meet this challenge and invest in doing it the right way, we should encourage and, uh, and always take into account uh, those kinds of equity considerations to make sure those communities most impacted are also seeing more benefit from the steps that we're taking forward. Now, sometimes the reverse is happening. Not only are we seeing tribal communities disproportionately impacted by climate change, but also disproportionately harmed by decisions to support the fossil fuel industry yes. that completely overrun tribal sovereignty. And it's why uh, I believe with respect certainly to all public lands in the United States, but in particular when we are talking about tribal lands, uh, that we return to the idea of uh, or uh, embrace the idea of free prior informed consent uh, and recognize the importance of the protection of these lands for many overlapping reasons uh, as a matter of stewardship and doing right by the future. Great. Thank you. And, you know, and again, I, I said thank you for being here. And, you know, there's always a lot of, um, there's a lot of issues that, that adversely affects Indian country. And, you know, I appreciate you taking the time to answer questions today and, and informing Indian country, uh, you know, what your plans are. And I, I, I know that if we went through all of the issues that the elections in no November and we'd still be talking. So I appreciate you uh, taking the time to answer these questions. Um, uh, the other question I, I would like to talk to you about is sovereignty. Tribal sovereignty is under attack before the courts and Congress. In, the, in a recent example, Preserving Access to Cost-Effective Drug Act was introduced in the Senate in June and marked up in a Senate Judiciary Committee. The legislation would adversely affect the sovereign immunity of tribes in multiple instances and pave the way for further erosion of the inherent, inherent authority of tribes to make decisions as sovereign nations. As President of the United States, what will you do to strengthen the government-to-government -government relationship, uphold treaties, and the federal government's trust responsibility and strengthen tribal sovereignty? So I've seen firsthand the power of the intergovernmental relationship that I consider to be that with tribal uh, government and tribal sovereignty. Uh, in our own community, South Bend, Indiana, uh, actually the first time that land and trust or Indian country came to our state, I'm proud to say that it was in the city limits of our uh, city and it was on my watch. Uh, and uh, the partnership that we formed with the Pekagan Band of Potawatomi Indians, who were the original residents of the land where my city now sits, uh, that partnership was also an education. Uh, in the issues that are at stake. And yet we don't see that tribal sovereignty respected right now in countless ways in federal government. There are several things we can do about that. First of all, I can commit to being a president who understands that this, this truly is a relationship between governments. Another thing is to make sure that we have a judiciary that respects and understands this too. And that means appointing judges and justices who understand tribal sovereignty and of course making sure the diversity of the bench greater includes native voices. And I believe it's important procedurally, just the way that we do things in the White House. One of many reasons why we need to restore uh, the White House Tribal Nations Conference where issues uh, like concerns, for example, about the legislation that you mentioned can be discussed and brought uh, to the attention of the President and, and, uh, and the White House. Uh, we need to make sure that this is an ongoing relationship where we not only enshrine these principles in our laws and in our customs and in our norms, but also in our habits. And, and the way for free prior informed consent to actually work is to make sure that the, uh, the head of the United States government understands that obligation to be working with tribal citizens and tribal governments across the U.S. Uh, in order to serve those who are both U.S and tribal citizens. And I would add uh, that, uh, as you know, uh, it is tribal citizens who have often disproportionately given to this country, yes. uh, disproportionately likely to serve in the military and to serve in other forms of public service. All the more reason we have to make sure that treaty obligations, trust obligations, and that crucial spirit of, of the relationship between governments is honored from the highest office in the land. Well, great. Thank you. And 
You know, again, I really want to say thank you as a veteran to a veteran. Uh, I wish you luck in, the, in your you. candidacy. And if people wanted to take and do more research into uh, what you're proposing for Indian country, where would they go to find that information? So we've released uh, a lot of detail around uh, some of the issues we've discussed and more. And I'd invite anybody interested to visit PeteForAmerica.com, uh, and you will find that uh, we have uh, a special section uh, describing our policies uh, for uh, First Nations, uh, uh, indigenous and tribal citizens. Great. Thank you, sir. Thank you.